Well, again, welcome to our second of our phase one reopening services. We're so happy to see you. We're so excited. I'm ready to get past phase one because I'm ready to start hugging some people and loving you. We're trying to be cooperative. We're trying hard. I know you're trying hard to cooperate. I'm trying to cooperate, but listen, it's going to be, uh, this is just not a new normal. This is just a temporary measure. Uh, normal will return at some point when there's a level of comfort that comes in and, uh, and we will celebrate that day. Amen. But in the meantime, we are talking about this idea that uh, if we are going to learn anything at all from our eight weeks of quarantine where we had to worship separately as a church family, Uh, what we wanted to learn from that lesson is that our church experience has to be so much more than simply a Sunday morning experience. We cannot allow our Sunday morning gatherings to define us as Christians. We're so thankful to be able to get these Sunday morning gatherings, but, but this Sunday morning gathering cannot define who we are as a people because the truth is we are family. Amen. Come on, everybody say it with me. We are family. We are family. And if you know the song, come on with me. We are family. All right. I'm not going to sing any further because I want to keep you here in the building for the rest of my time. But uh, we are family. In Romans chapter 12, verse 5, the scripture says, So in Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We are called not only to be believers, we are called to be belongers. That is not good grammar, but it is great theology. We belong to one another. I hope Glad Tidings isn't just the church you go to. I hope it's the the family that you belong to. And so in this series, we're talking about what it means to be a church family. Family, that we want to be a church family that, that, uh, that grows together as a family, that blesses others as a family, and takes good care of one another as a family. And this week, I really want to move into the first of these three thoughts and talk about what it means to grow together as a family. And when we talk about growing together as a family, we are really talking about discipleship. We're talking about the idea that as Christians, as people who are followers of Jesus Christ, our Christianity is not defined by simply uh, a religious experience or a religious gathering, and it, and it cannot be limited to, limited to the simple hope that if we put our faith in Christ, that one day when we die, we'll go to heaven. That's not all there is to being a Christian. As a matter of fact, if there's anything to being a Christian, it is to be like Christ. The word Christian itself kind of came from a, 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 a mocking term that people People that were outside of the faith, they said, oh, you're one of those, you're one of those Christians. And it was, it was actually meant to be an insult to the followers of Christ that they were Christians. But Christians, we said, hey, no, that's exactly what we're trying to be. We're trying to be like Christ. And so we accepted that moniker. And now we wear it as a badge honor that we are Christians. We are Christians. But what that term literally means is that we are growing in our faith and becoming more and more like Jesus. Because how many know our faith is a precious faith? It is a faith filled with great and precious promises. But far too many people who call all themselves Christians are living so far below the, the promises that God has given to us. How many know that Jesus said that I have come that you might have life and life more abundantly, an abundant life. But he also said in that same breath, he said, but you know what? There is a thief that has come to steal and to kill and destroy that wants to rob us of that life, rob us of that experience with God. And so what do we need to do, my friends? Well, you know what we need to do? We need to make sure that we are not just having a religious experience and certainly not just a Sunday morning experience, but that as a part of the family of God, that we are growing in our faith as believers. I noticed that up in our riser section today, I have, we have the Dakota family sitting up there, uh, Willie and Melissa, and uh, they have a, brought to church today one of our brand new members, little Brielle Dakota. And it's so exciting to see Brielle in the house of God today. She was born during kind of this quarantine time. So we're so excited to see Brielle in the house of the Lord. And how many know that... Um, 
These times of Brielle being an infant, they're precious times, right? For those of you that have children or grandchildren, I mean, when they're little and they just kind of wiggle around and just kind of, you know, squeak a little bit, it's precious times. Everything's cute at that time, right? Their crying is cute. The poo is cute. Everything's cute when they're, they're little like that. They get older and, you know, the, it's not as cute. But, um, you know, the other things become cuter, you know, because we want them to grow. Sometimes... Sometimes when we are uh, family members and raising children and grandchildren, we say things like, you know, we say things like, oh, you know, I just love that age. We love them when they were just little. Oh, if they could have only stayed little that whole time. But the truth is, the truth is we don't want them to stay little forever. We want them to grow. We want them to grow up. As a matter of fact, the opposite is true, right? The truth is if if one of our little children, if they're, if they're not growing, hey, we're heading to the doctor. We're calling for some prayer warriors. We're saying, hey, something is not right here because all healthy things grow. And so as cute as Brielle is right now in her little infant stage, we want her to grow. We want her to get those little chubby cheeks and put on some rolls, right? We want her healthy and strong and growing up into the person that God has created her to be as her, her family provides this healthy, nurturing environment for her to grow. Well, guess what, friends? We want that for our church family too. We want every person who has found faith in Christ not to stay a spiritual infant, but to grow up in their faith. I love the scripture in 2 Peter chapter 1, where the apostle Peter begins to address this idea where we should grow up in our faith because our faith is a precious faith and it has precious promises. So, in 2 Peter, starting with very, uh, the very first chapter, very first verse, Simon Peter, the apostle, introduces himself, and he says, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. How many know that when Simon Peter talks about being an apostle, it's because he was an eyewitness. He was there with Jesus from the very beginning. He was an eyewitness of Jesus's miracles, his teaching. He was there when Jesus walked on the water, when he fed the, the multitudes miraculously, uh, when he raised Lazarus from the dead. Simon Peter was there as, and, and watched as Jesus died on the cross. And he was there on that first Sunday morning when Jesus rose from the dead victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And Simon Peter, man, he kind of has this special place in the kingdom of God because he was right there in the middle of Jesus's life. And, and, and yet here's what Simon Peter writes. He says, so I'm this apostle of Jesus Christ. And, he's, and then he addresses his letter to the church, to us. And he says, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, have received a faith, watch this, a faith as precious as ours. Everybody say the word precious. Precious, a precious faith. In other words, as amazing as the faith of the Apostle Peter is because he was there, the Apostle Peter says, hey, but our faith isn't more precious than your faith. Your faith is just as precious. Even though maybe we weren't physical eyewitnesses of the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus, the apostle says, our faith, it matters just as much. It is a precious faith. He goes on in verse 3 and says, his divine power, speaking of the, the power of God, his divine power has given us everything we need. Come on, everybody, say everything. Say everything we need. It has given us everything we need. For what? For a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Verse 4 says, through these, he has given us very great. Come on, say very great. Very great and precious promises. Hey, not only has God given us a precious faith, he has given us very great and precious promises. Why? Why would God do that? Watch this. It says, so that because through them, through our precious faith and through these precious promises, so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature. Wow. The divine nature having escaped the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. What does this mean? What is the apostle Peter saying here? He's saying to us, hey friends, this faith you have, 
It is a precious faith. It is a faith you need to protect. And these promises you have, they're incredible promises. They're great and precious promises. Well, what are the promises that you and I can actually share in the life of God? Jesus literally through his salvation and through his Holy Spirit has invited us to live in and experience his divine life in his divine kingdom. Think about that with me, friends. God said, hey, listen, you're not just trying to survive this world you're living in. You're invited into the divine life of God and to experience kingdom life. Jesus modeled that kingdom life for us. And in the kingdom of God, there is, there is provision. In the kingdom of God, there is healing. In the kingdom of God, there is hope. In the kingdom of God, there is restoration. And Jesus has invited us through our precious faith and through these precious palm promises to experience this divine life in his divine kingdom. Wow, what an incredible promise. But then the apostle Peter doesn't stop there. He goes on in verse five, and this was actually our scripture from the day. And, and so the apostle Peter, he says, for this very reason, what's the reason? Promises and faith that are precious for this reason, make every effort, come on, say every effort. Make every effort to add to your faith. Come on, everybody say add. You know what he's talking about there? He's talking about growth. He's talking about discipleship. He's talking about not staying a spiritual infant, but adding to your faith, growing your faith, embracing discipleship. He says to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control. I kind of like the way Mackenzie and, and Barry, uh, Barry Bright did it this morning, but I won't even try that. But to add to your, uh, uh, God, uh, to add to your self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. Okay, just one time. I just wanted to do it one time. It was so cute. He said, for if you possess these qualities in increasing measure. Come on, everybody say increasing. Increasing measure, not stagnant, not growing 10 years ago, continuing to grow. Uh, if you have these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I am afraid that far too many people that call themselves Christians have allowed themselves to become unproductive and ineffective in their faith because they stopped growing. Maybe they, maybe they prayed the prayer for salvation, hoping that when they die, they get to go to heaven. But but then just stopped right there. Or, or maybe they said, well, I'll go to church. But then their whole Christian discipleship experience is only built on their Sunday morning church experiences. Friends, we cannot allow Sunday mornings or even our salvation experience alone to define our Christian faith. We must embrace the path of discipleship and grow together as a family. If I can say it this way, discipleship is actually the path to an effective and productive life in God. It's actually our discipleship, our discipline that brings about our freedom in Christ. I know for some people, they feel like that freedom means I get to do nothing. You know, freedom is when I don't have any responsibilities and freedom when I, is when I do nothing and just indulge my, my selfishness or indulge my nature. Friends, that's not freedom, that's bondage. That's addiction. God has real freedom for us and it comes through discipleship. It comes through self-discipline so that we can experience the life God has for us. And I want to just challenge us that we need to fight for this discipleship because it will not just happen by itself. And we have a very real enemy that wants to rob us of this experience called discipleship. So we need to fight for our personal and corporate discipleship. I heard a story about Alexander the Great. It's this legendary story about this great military leader, Alexander the Great. And he was uh, called to preside over a military tribunal, a, a court martial, because one of his troops, one of Alexander's troops, had been accused of cowardice in battle. And if there was one thing that was going to cause Alexander's blood to just boil, it would be cowardice amongst his troop. And so he sat in his judgment seat over this proceeding and the, and the accused was brought forward, a young man. And, and he stood by himself in this court, just terrified as he stood before the incredible general, Alexander the Great. 
And uh, to begin the proceedings, Alexander the Great, he demanded of the accused, what is your name? And the accused, so fraught with fear, he was just literally paralyzed and, and couldn't even get a word out. Alexander the Great, being uh, a little bit frustrated with this lack of response, raised his voice and leaned forward in his seat and, and, and said even, even a more forceful tone, young man, I asked you, what is your name? Filled with fear and trembling, the young man just summoned what strength he had and he barely got out a whisper, my name is Alexander. Alexander the Great was infuriated. He couldn't believe what he had just heard. He drew his sword and, and rushed towards the young man and, and demanded of him in a, in a scolding loud tone, what did you say your name is? And the young man at this time, just weak with terror, expecting the worst, expecting a, a corporate punishment, an execution of his life, just choked out the words, my name is Alexander. The great general and leader turned from that position and returned to a seat, seated chair and, and did something that everybody uh, was completely unexpected. He did something that nobody thought would happen. All of a sudden, in disgust, he gave the young soldier a pardon. And he said, young man, you will change your conduct or you will change your name couldn't stand the fact that a coward would bear his name. Can I just remind us, my dear friends, that we stand with a name that is greater than the name Alexander the Great. We stand with the name of Jesus, the name that is above every name, the name of Christ. And when we call ourselves Christians, we need to make sure that we are not allowing our faith to remain infantile, but that we embrace the path of discipleship and let our lives become effective and productive for the King who is King of all kings and Lord of all lords, our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so I want to just close with a couple of thoughts before I invite Pastor Daryl to come up and bring the message home for our kids that are in service with us today. But the first thought is this, that I want to invite you to own your discipleship, to own it, to take hold of the discipleship that God has called you to and decide for yourself no more excuses. No more excuses. No longer am I waiting for the church to come up with the right program. No longer will I wait for this teacher or that teacher. No longer will I expect the pastor to be in charge of my discipleship. But because of the great name that I name as mine, Jesus Christ, and I as a Christian, I am going to own my own personal discipleship. Where do you start if you're going to own your discipleship? Just open up your Bible and just start reading. Just start there. If there was one book series that I could re recommend to you, for those of you that want to just take seriously your discipleship, I would recommend one book series to you that I think is probably one of the greatest tools for forming the Spirit of God within you and the character of Christ within you. It's called The Good and Beautiful Book Series. So there's three books in the series. One is called The Good and Beautiful God. One is called The Good and Beautiful and beautiful life, and one is called the Good and Beautiful Community. And literally, it's a manual for the formation of the Spirit of Christ within us. And if there was just one I was going to recommend, there's lots I could recommend, but if I was going to recommend just one, I would recommend that you pick up this book series and begin to say, you know what? I'm not leaving my discipleship to someone else. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to get some soul training, and I am going to grow in my faith. And then the second thing I would invite you to do, besides just maybe opening up your Bible and getting this book series, is I would encourage you, if you're going to fight for your discipleship, to forge discipleship relationships. And again, I use the word forge because you have to take hold of it. You have to fight for it. You got to figure out who God has put in your life and get in these discipleship relationships because discipleship is most effective within the context of community. And so maybe you should, maybe you should go out and buy one or three of these books, but then just don't do it alone. 
Find two or three people that are as hungry for God as you are. Find two or three people that are as serious about living out this Christian life as you are and say, hey, let's do this together. Because if you are uh, doing your discipleship alone or in isolation, then you are settling for at best, at best 50% of what God wants to do and accomplish in your life. Most of what God wants to do, quite honestly, in your life through discipleship must happen in the context of community with discipleship relationships. And so I'm challenging you. Uh, you know, we're going to try to do some things as a church to create some spaces where you can be in our groups, you know, whether those are foundation groups or freedom groups or family groups. But don't wait for the church to have these groups. Get with other believers. Just make up in your mind and decide, I am going to forge discipleship relationships. Relationships. I'm going to own my discipleship and I'm going to forge these di discipleship relationships. The truth is every one of us, if we're a family, if we're a family of believers, if we're not just a church organization, then every one of us needs in our discipleship relationships, we need some, we need some discipleship fathers, right? We need some fathers that are speaking into our lives. Every one of us, we need some brothers and sisters. We need, you know, when I say fathers, fathers and mothers, we need some brothers and sisters who are speak, you know, who are making this journey with us. And then each one of us, we also need some spiritual sons and daughters, discipleship sons and daughters that we will just share what we've learned in Christ and, and pass along to others. And can I tell you that in this way, if we will embrace the discipleship journey, our lives will be different. Our homes will be different. Our workplaces will be different. As we allow Christ to transform us, our schools will be different. Our community will be different. It will make a difference. Why? Because the greatest testimony of the greatness of our Savior is a life that has been transformed. When people see what God is doing in our hearts, it makes a difference in their lives. When they see the selflessness, when they see the sacrifice, when they see the transformation into Christ-likeness, nothing, nothing impacts our world like a transformed life. That's how we can become effective and productive in the kingdom of God. And I want to challenge us, dear friends, let's not be ineffective and unproductive as Christians. Let's not bear the name of Jesus in vain, but let's grow together as a family of believers in our faith. It's a precious faith, and we have precious promises. Now, to make sure that our children are getting uh, their message this morning, I've invited Pastor Daryl to come on up, and uh, why don't you help me give Pastor Daryl a warm welcome as he helps our children to understand that we are family and that we need to grow together as a family. I'll be back to pray at the conclusion. Amen, amen. Hello, family of God. Hallelujah. I'm so excited to do family services. I think this is so important for our kids to see us worshiping, for us to see our kids worshiping, to see us praying, to see our kids praying, see us giving, and see our kids giving in the BGMC. Such an awesome time to be together, growing together. And fun arts and fine arts is so amazing. I mean, didn't Gavin do great? I mean, that was great. Just give him another hand. Hallelujah. Elizabeth Foster is also in the house, and, and she did a dance solo, and she also got superior with a merit of honor. Let's give, we were so blessed. Little Hannah in our children's church, also she did a gospel message, and she did a solo dance, and she did a solo song, and in two of those, she got superior with merit of honor also. Let's give little Hannah a hand. We are just so blessed. I love I love their theme this year was, was discover, develop, deploy. Discover your gift, develop that gift, and deploy for service. And, you know, all these kids that were, were performing and, and, and competing in fun arts, they serve every week in children's church. So they not only learn their gift and, and, and compete with it, but then they use it for ministry. That's what it's all about. So today I'm going to be talking about God's plan for us, like Pastor was talking about. And I happen to love eggs. I, th I just love the incredible edible egg. I think you can do so many things with eggs. I think everything you can cook is better with eggs. I mean, you can boil them, you can scramble them, you can poach them. 
You can fry them. I mean, you can put them in chicken salad. You can put them in tuna fish salad. You can put them, you can put them in potato salad. I like to put them in my gumbo. I like when you eat a hamburger, throw an egg on it. I like waffles in the morning, throw an egg. I think eggs are like oh, this perfect, wonderful food. So it's going to represent us because we're also perfect and wonderful in God's eyes. But you know what? You've got to get past the shell. You know, we put these hard shells, too, in our lives. I cannot eat that egg. I'm not going to eat the shell to get through the egg. i got to remove that shell. And that's what God wants to do in our life. He wants us to remove the shell. To me, the best way to break an egg, you just drop it, and then it breaks perfectly. So God wants what's inside. God wants that ooey, gooey inside. You know, we all have those ooey, gooey insides, but we need to get rid of those shells in our lives. We just need to throw those shells away because they're useless. God wants that ooey, gooeyness. You know, God has a fantastic plan for our ooey, gooeyness. I mean, if we look at our scripture today, it's for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge, to knowledge self-control, self-control, perseverance, perseverance, godliness, godliness, mutual affection, and mutual affection, love. Isn't that amazing? That's what God, God wants us to choose. This is going to represent God. This pan is going to represent God. We've got to choose to be in God's presence. We've got to choose to put our ooey gooeyness and everything that he's given us in to his presence. And then we've got to ask for God's covering. I like, Pastor said, his divine power covering. If we can put God's divine power covering in our lives, then faith, goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, uh, mutual affection. I like, I like brotherly affection instead of mutual affection and love. Then God can do something amazing and wonderful in our life. Now, I can't do magic. I can't do miracles, but we serve a miracle-working God who wants to transform us into what he's created us to be. If we can just, like Pastor said, if we can just grow together so we can bless others, taking care of each other. God wants us to be strong leaders. God wants us to be a healthy church. How many of you want to be a healthy church? How many of you want to be, how many of you want God to take care of you, ooey, gooey us? Amen. <laughs> Let's give a hand clap of praise to our pastor as he comes back out. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Daryl, for helping all of us, not just the kids, understand that we need to let God do that transformation work in our lives. Would you stand with me and let me pray a blessing over us and let's invite God to lead us in the paths of discipleship. Would you join me in that prayer? Would you join me in asking the Holy Spirit to lead us in a journey of discipleship, not only individually, but as the family of God, that we would all grow up as God intends us to grow. So Heavenly Father, I pray right now for every uh, member of our church family, everyone who's in attendance today, everyone who's joining us online. And Lord God, we pray that you would help us to not remain spiritual infants, but that, God, that you would grow us up. God, you would take what's inside of us and that you would transform it, oh God, into something wonderful and something beautiful and something useful, effective, and productive in your sight. Lord, I pray for every individual person who is here, Lord God. Help us, oh God, to take ownership of our personal discipleship. Help us to lay aside our excuses and to take up our cross that we may serve and follow your purposes. And Lord God, I pray for divine connections. I pray for discipleship relationships within our family, Lord God, that not only would we believe, but that we would belong. Lord God, bless our efforts. May our lives be transformed. May our homes, our schools, our our workplaces, may our community be transformed, oh God, as we embrace the path of discipleship for our lives and for our church. And Lord, we pray these blessings in Jesus' name and everybody said amen and amen. God bless you, my dear friends. We love you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us in the house of God today. Have a great, great week.